this session is focused a little bit on the history um, of CRS and a turning point for us. And so I've asked, um, well, the, the organizers have asked one of our longstanding um, uh, uh, staff members and leaders in this agency, Christine Tucker, to address you for a while. When they asked me to speak a little bit about mission and, and strategy, um, and I was delighted to do so because it's been a particular passion of mine. Um, but it started off with lots of questions. You might ask, how does CRS see its identity and its mission in 2012? What is the significance of our identity being both American and Catholic? How did these two aspects inform our mission over time? And how has our history and experiences shaped our mission as we see it today? I have to tell you that the fullness of our sense of mission and identity have really evolved over time. And that has been a result of our reflection of our role as a church in a changing world environment. So this evolution really is best seen from a historical perspective. What you are seeing here is actually the first CRS project. This was the receiving and the settling of Polish refugees re released from the Soviet Gulag. These folks walked from Siberia down to Iran, and that is where we received them. The next slide you're seeing here is one of, um, one of our early programs after that was actually in Paris. We were uh, created as war relief services. Our origins were in Europe and in East Asia during the end of World War II and immediately following. Our main challenge at that time was rebuilding Europe. Fortunately, the Marshall Plan meant that we had large resources from the US government in order to do it. The church's vision at that time was to bring mission to the world driven by compassion and charity. We live that out primarily by providing food along with clothing. The distribution was done directly. So what you see here, this was in Paris, and um, our efforts were, were delivered primarily through religious congregations and through di the church hierarchy. The staff was primarily clerical and male. At that time, we also in the United States had the first CRS collection, which was a very generous collection. We received almost a million dollars, which was quite significant at that time. As we went into Paris, we went in at the invitation of the fresh bis French bishops and the papal nuncio. And that same process of invitation continues today. The other office that we had was in Rome. Now, as part of our, you can see here the juxtaposition between our American identity and our church identity. The gentleman on the right is Monsignor Landy, who is famous in CRS history. He was with us in some capacity for almost 50 years. Um, you will see also the emphasis on food and clothing. As these efforts of rebuilding Europe came to a close, it marked the first major transformation for war relief services. And those are identified by the change in our name and the expansion of our mission. So we went from war relief services to Catholic relief services. This transformation took place from the 50s into the 60s. The changes in the world were that the Cold War was now in place. CRS became part of the containment of communism from the Truman Document. This period marked the emergence of the role of faith-based organizations. Also, Church World Service was created at this time, as was CARE and some other organizations. As we shifted our name from war relief services to Catholic relief services, 
We also expanded our mission around the world. The US bishops thought that as they looked around, uh, they saw poverty in many developing countries. And so rather than closing at the end of our first mission, they decided to work with church officials around the world in creating a worldwide structure for humanitarian assistance. For those of you who are familiar with the Caritas Internationales Network, this was the beginning of that. And there's many stories of CRS folks in those days literally being in a VW bus, driving from country to country in Africa, being in conversations with the local church officials, discussing this vision, and creating these local structures. The emphasis, or should I say the mission of this, was largely focused on humanitarian assistance. You, you continue to have food aid, clothing, and now medicine be the main resources. But in terms of food, there was a major expansion of the food program. So by the light, late 1950s, CRS actually managed 62% of the US government food distribution around the world. To this, we added formally programs related to Catholic Medical Mission Board, which was the delivery of excess medicines, pharmaceuticals. We had the beginning of the Thanksgiving clothing collection, which was done in parishes and Catholic organizations around the country that was then shipped overseas. And we had the formalization of what became the American Bishop's Overseas Appeal. So you can see here that the emphasis continued to remain primarily on food. The next transformation took place in the 60s, approximately through the mid-90s. And I would call this the period of socioeconomic development. Now, on the one hand, you did continue to have humanitarian assistance, primarily in the form of food. You also had CRS increase its capacity to respond to major emergencies, such as Biafra and uh, famine in Ethiopia. However, during this time, there was also a new emphasis on socioeconomic development programs in newly independent third world countries. So at that time, you had humanitarian assistance and you had emerging development programs. But the way this was viewed as primarily a resource transfer. In other words, poverty, hunger, disease were a lack of resources. So we saw our job as trying to mobilize as many resources as possible to shift them overseas and to solve the problem of poverty. Very straightforward. I know you've all heard of the phrase, if you, feed, if, if you give a man a fish, he will eat today. And if you teach him how to fish, he will be able to feed himself tomorrow. That very much speaks to how we approached our work. During this time, there was a shift in staff. We put greater emphasis on professionalism, higher levels of formal education, more lay participa participation, but the staff continued to be primarily male. There was a, a lot of growth also in terms of the identity of, with other non-governmental organizations, such as CARE, Save the Children, et cetera. And part of that was an increase more in the American identity rather than the Catholic identity. There were many people who suggested that Catholics should come out of our name because they somehow saw this as a way of having less program quality or somehow getting watered down in issues of faith rather than high quality development programs. So our Catholic identity at this point became somewhat lost and confused. There was a certain amount of tension between those people who were involved with the humanitarian programs and those people who were involved with socioeconomic development programs 
because they were seen as a trade-off, with greater emphasis being placed on socioeconomic development. And nagging doubts began to creep in, with people asking, is this really enough? This leads to the segue to our next major transformation, which is a change in the world environment. We saw the end of the Cold War. We saw a contraction in the agency finances. We saw a crisis in terms of the morale and vision of staff within CRS. Then, in 1994, Rwanda happened. As you know, during this period of just 100 days, there were 800,000 people, mainly Tutsis, who were killed. CRS had been in Rwanda for decades, doing what we thought was good humanitarian assistance and good development programs. We were aware of the tension between the Tutsis and the Hutus, but we saw this as a political problem, and we thought that this was not part of our mission. Yet, as we saw the genocide unfold, and we saw our colleagues, our staff, many of their family members killed or having to flee for their lives, we were filled with pain and disillusionment and in sometimes anger. And we asked ourselves, how could we have missed this? How could we have not seen this as central to our mission? In many ways, we realized that we had missed Vatican II. This began a time of very intensive prayer, discussion, and planning, because we knew we were in a crisis. In the process that unfolded, which had began to mark a period of very rapid transformation, transformation that I would say is still unfolding, there were a couple of really important things that happened early on. The first is that we rediscovered our Catholic identity. We knew that being American first was not what we needed as an agency, but we needed to rediscover and recapture our Catholic identity. As part of this, we discovered, not rediscovered, but we discovered Catholic social teaching. And from this, we developed a set of guiding principles, which were for the agency as a whole, which are based on the principles of Catholic social teaching. At that point, we realized that the questions that we had been asking about relief and development were incomplete and, frankly, in some cases, the wrong questions that we should have been asking. We had not been looking at relations in society or the structural problems that existed. It became clear to us that the problems of poverty were often about class, ethnicity, and political divisions and not a lack of resources. The question then became not just the tension between feeding a fish today or teaching how to fish, but asking questions about what about those large groups of people in society who don't need a fish today and who already know how to fish, but society tells them they can't have access to the river because of their gender, their religion, their race, or their creed. And that really is, in a nutshell, what launched the justice lens. This is, was a radical departure for us, and it posed many, many challenges, beginning with really basic questions like, what is justice? What do we mean by that? There were many who feared that it was about judgment, about us making judgments about who was right and wrong in local societies, that it meant taking on the court system and doing legal advocacy overseas, that it was about what people deserve, rather than the understanding that justice 
is about right relationships. Another challenge was fear. Many people were afraid that if we did the justice lens, that we were saying that what they had dedicated their lives to, that being humanitarian assistance or technical approaches, was wrong, that they had wasted their lives, or that they would lose their jobs. Another was the question of, if we're going to do this, what will we do differently? And as we began this process, that's the question we didn't have an answer to. But we were committed to finding out that answer. And where that led was tremendous transformation all across the agency. And many of the presentations that you're going to hear during the rest of your time are going to focus on different aspects of that change. And so what I'm going to do is just give you the broad overview but know that you'll get into it more in depth in other sessions. So let me speak first to the transformation that took place overseas. First, about our priorities. The first was HIV AIDS. Up until then, we had not been working in AIDS because we saw AIDS as primarily a, a medical technical problem. But when we began to look at it through the justice lens and we saw the vulnerability of people, how they were stigmatized within their local societies, we knew that because of Catholic social teaching, we had to begin working with AIDS. And that became one of our largest programs in the years to follow. The next was peace building. Up until then, we hadn't been involved with peace building at all, but this was a direct result of our reflection, not only about Rwanda, but at the other conflict that we were seeing take place around the world. This next slide also speaks to two overarching pillars which we incorporated into our work. The first is partnership, and the next is integral human development. The partnership aspect is one that we had had for a while, but it elevated in terms of importance, that we knew that as much as what we did, it was just as important, if not more so, how we built the local capacity of organizations so that they could be actors within their own society. And the second, integral human development, was not just deciding which areas are we going to work in, such as agriculture or health, but really how to look at those needs in a very holistic fashion. You will have a presentation about integral human development later on, but let me say that this is the first time that we incorporated assets of spiritual development as well as humanitarian assistance and development. Next came the transformation of our operations in the United States. The segue here to the major transformation is our reflection on how we relate to US Catholics. This was a very different way of thinking about our mission. Up until then, we had seen Catholics in the US as, in essence, a source for unrestricted funding. We thought, if we tell Catholics what we're doing overseas, they will give us money. We will do good things with that. And that's what the relationship was fundamentally about. This next slide speaks in part to what Joan began to talk about earlier, which was we realized that we needed to have a much more profound relationship with Catholics in the United States. And that was the genesis of the creation of the US Operations Division. Now, you have to remember that overseas, we have been working for 70 years. In the United States, with the exception of perhaps Operation Rice Bowl and the annual appeal, we had not been working in any formal way with Catholics or with Catholic organizations. So in that sense, our track record is very much still developing. And that's why Joan said, we're trying to figure it out as we go along. What is interesting is that just like with our overseas operations, we developed programs in conjunction with our overseas partners 
That's what we see ourselves doing here in the United States, is not developing program offerings which we then try to market as much as it is try to develop programs with our partners in the U.S. so that we can have a shared mission. It also changed the way we looked at fundraising and we shifted our terminology from fundraising to charitable giving because we saw fundraising dimensions more from the perspective of Catholics in the United States have a variety of gifts to pray, to learn, to act, and to give. And fundraising, if you will, is simply another way to share of the gifts that they have. What you see here are an example of the new programs which have been done. Um, I'm not going to go into any depth at all with them. Um, but it just illustrates, as I say, with the exception of Operation Rice Bowl, these are all new programs. So one of the hallmarks of this new strategy was how the pieces come together. If we have transformation overseas as well as transformation in the U.S., how do they come together in a very practical way? And the example that I'd like to illustrate for you here is Hurricane Mitch. On the one hand, after Hurricane Mitch hit Central America, we did do relief and development programs because of the tremendous need that was there. But our U.S. partners were also an integral part of our strategy. We did advocacy in Washington related to the U.S. government providing more funds for beleaguered Central America. We incorporated lobbying to end the temporary, uh, to end the deportation of folks who were here. We developed twinning and partnerships. So in this sense, it was really U.S. operations and overseas operations coming together with a common vision. And for those of you who were involved with Haiti, you saw the same thing happening. This led, next slide, to a new mission statement, which is the one that we have today. Now, I would, as I wrap this presentation up, I'd really like to leave you with two points. The first is that this session is not fundamentally a history lecture. Rather, it's a challenge. CRS has continually reshaped itself multiple times, structurally and programmatically, because of the changing world environment and the needs of those we served. We haven't finished yet. As you, some of you may know, we're currently revisiting our current strategy precisely because we see rapid changes happening overseas and we want to be able to address those needs. I have to tell you that while I may have presented this as somewhat of a seamless transition, it was pretty painful because what was required was not just new technical approaches, but adaptive changes that challenged the hearts and the minds of people who were dedicated their entire professional lives and sometimes their personal lives as well to this tremendous mission. The second point I'd like to make is that there is no magic bullet. The answers and the decisions that we made in the past are not necessarily the right ones for CRS moving forward in the future, nor are they necessarily the right answers for other organizations. The role of Catholic colleges and universities is critical to us moving forward precisely because where you sit is a perfect place to think through and act on the relationship between love, charity, and justice, and what it means to be church in the world today. So I'd like to pose a couple of questions based on our history. The first is, in our experience, alleviating suffering and poverty are not just about technical solutions or transfers of resources, 
Nor is education just a transfer of knowledge and the ability to think critically. So the first question that I would pose is, how can we as Americans stretch our heads and hearts to see and to live the dynamic tension between charity and justice? The second question comes from our experience which says, change can be very painful, but also necessary. And that fear is an important obstacle to change. So the question then becomes, how can we overcome fear of change in our institutions to unlock our potential and that of those we serve? And lastly, as you continue your discussions, what aspects of our work and partnership require greater boldness? Thank you.